this is my post, Kevin. Or this is where you worked back yep. in the day. That's exactly right. Gene Cassidy was a regular kid growing up in New Jersey. He went and followed his dreams of going to college, graduating, and then starting a family. Until one day he was shot in the line of duty. This is the Gene Cassidy story and how he was able to persevere through that hard time and became the man he is today. Okay, I was born in uh, New York, Astoria General Hospital, located in Queens. I then uh, moved to New Jersey. From that point forward, I went to York College of Pennsylvania. Um, while at the college for four years, from 79 through 83, I was a, a member of a fraternity. I uh, was a shot putter on the track team, as well as also an intramural director. I met my wife, Patty. Um, early on at the end of our junior year. In my junior year of college, I met Gene. Um, one of my sorority sisters was dating his roommate and we were sitting in the library one day, put her number up, she had changed it from 10 and made it a higher number. And I said, why would you give Gene Cassidy higher than a 10? And she said, because his personality puts him right over the top. I thought, ah, oh, I really want to meet this guy. We've been together ever since. During the time I was looking around and I was deciding as to where to work and I chose uh, Baltimore City. I glanced outside on the uh, eighth floor of the building and I looked at the Inner Harbor and I thought this would be a perfect place to live and to work and to experience my family. I then applied for the Baltimore Police Department where uh, I was working in the Western District. And he got a job down in Baltimore and uh, we got married and we moved down here. Um, th things were going along well. We bought our first house. On October 22nd, 1987, I was working the uh, 4 to 12 shift. It was about 11 o'clock at night. I was um, driving in a marked car. I had seen an individual with whom I had written a warrant for not 10 days earlier. At that point, what had happened was I had taken him, I began to place him against the wall, okay? And at that juncture, he uh, took his elbow, swung it back against my chest, ripped my radio off, and drew a gun with his right hand. Uh, he fired three times at me. The first shot ricocheted off of the one wall. And, uh, the second shot struck me directly in the cheek, uh, boring its way through my brain. Uh, the second shot was placed directly against my temple, and it was called a contact wound. And what he had chosen to do at that juncture was to pull the trigger and fire the bullet in to my head. And that bullet still lies within my brain as we're speaking. The word we were given in the beginning was that he was already dead. The doctor there said that he had a 2% chance of surviving. It was historically and still and remains one of the highest crime districts in the city. One of the first officers said he didn't know that it was Gene. Blood was covering up the name tag and you couldn't tell from the face. At that time, the uh, citizenry were looking out the window, contacted the uh, police department. My white shirt was crimson in color. I was waiting for him to get home. A little way after midnight, I got a knock on the door from two of his co-workers and they wouldn't tell me what had happened. They said they just came to pick me up. But as we started to drive, the radio was on and the person in the back seat leaned up and turned it off. And that's when I knew that it must have been serious. So um, we got down to the hospital and we went in the back of uh, shock trauma. And I heard them yelling, the wife's here, the wife's here. And then that's when the doctors came in and told me that he had been shot twice in the head at point blank range. But they told me that they didn't know what the extent of any brain damage would be, what any um, injuries uh, for what the future would hold. We proceeded to sit at the hospital every day for the next two weeks, uh, praying that he would survive. It was a, uh, a very, very nice, crisp um, day on October 22nd, 1987. Um, I was up, uh, actually the last thing that I do remember that day was being up my father and mother-in-law's home having a couple of hot dogs. I don't remember driving to my house. I don't remember showering or anything along those lines under the, on the operating table for eight hours. I was in the hospital for a total of four weeks. One morning I got a call from the hospital to come right away because he had started to talk. Um, you know, things were still foggy and you know, we raced down to the hospital and we went in his room and 
uh, Gene's mother and a friend of mine and I went in the room and at that point he was joking around with the nurse and he was talking in Spanish and my friend Andrea thought that he had uh, had a head injury and woke up and was going to now speak Spanish and he lost his sense of smell, his sense of taste, he lost his sight, but he still had his sense of humor. Yes, we had uh, decided to have a second opinion and we traveled um, to Johns Hopkins MRI clinic. He said, Agent Cassidy, um, unfortunately there was nothing that we can do at this time until technology improves. And I said to my brother, I said, well, you know, don't worry, Tom. We'll wait until the doctor comes. And my brother expressed to me that that wasn't the doctor. Yeah. Um, so it was a, it was a very, very uh, uh, a trail of tears in actuality. So two more weeks, he was at shock trauma. He was there a total of four, and then they released him to go to rehab. Uh, the administrator at the hospital said, uh, Mr. Casting, how long do you think you'll be in our facility? And he said, well, I'm going to cut that in half. I'll be here for two weeks. And the guy just laughed, and I saw him laughing and writing it down. But in two weeks, he was packing his bags and leaving because he has determination like uh, and no one else I know. Um, during that time frame when I was in the hospital, my wife was extremely stressed. And, uh, what happened was, at times, physically getting sick in the mornings. Nine months later, So we had just bought our first house, I was pregnant with Lauren, um, you know, he definitely had a lot going on. You know, when Lauren was born, it really gave us a focus away from everything that had happened. Um, at this point, right now, I am 100% blind. Um, you can imagine closing your eyes and seeing the electrical impulses that are around. Um, I do not happen to have those. My uh, vision, or my actual sight, is 100% like flat black. When I uh, do fall asleep, uh, do I dream? Yes, obviously. Do I dream in colors? Yes. Can I see things and just approach things from that standpoint of uh, visualizing what's going on? I can. After the injury, uh, Patty and I wait, wait, did some uh, deep soul searching. We decided upon having our lives return to a sense of normalcy. What I believe to be normal, as my wife believes to be normal, is that of getting up and going to work and uh, coming home, listening to my daughter at the recitals, um, supporting Kevin in his wrestling uh, days in high school and uh, in college. It's one thing that I have uh, chosen always to, to get forth in doing, myself and my wife driving on doing the best that we can do. When the person that shot Gene came up for his uh, first parole hearing, uh, Kevin said, well, maybe us kids should write letters, meaning himself and his sister. And and um, Gene said, well, you know, that that's up to you. Kevin thought about it for a minute and he said, well, I don't know how I could say it affected my life. There's nothing that you can't do. Growing up, a lot of my friends would ask me how his life differently with the blind father and whatnot, but it was all I knew, so I was just used to it. And my dad was able to do everything normal parents could do. Like, he would still throw the football with me. He still always came to my wrestling matches, was the loudest fan there. He did not let the shooting stop him at all. So really, the only thing Gene can't do is drive. The, the kids have known him to do, do everything that anyone else's dad did. I mean, uh, you know, it really is pretty incredible. Uh, they asked him at the police department, you know, what he wanted to do, did he want to retire? Gene said, well, I'd like to teach at the academy. And Kevin was born um, September 1st, 1991. And um, I believe two or three days after that, Gene went back back to work and uh, he's been there ever since. Once Gene woke up and got out of the hospital, we both had the same focus and determination to get our lives back to normal. His recovery was remarkable. Uh, he's so good at getting around sometimes people think that he's not completely blind. So there's really very few people in the department that haven't been through the academy since Gene's been teaching there. 1996, some of the Ravens arrived in town and um, immediately Patty and I chose to uh, get 
get a couple of season tickets. And in fact, we have them uh, today. It just drives us all uh, closer and so forth. My son and I attend uh, almost every uh, Ravens game that there is in the area, in Baltimore, as well as also uh, Kevin and I have traveled. We went to Super Bowl 47. We saw Ray's last game. Ray Lewis was doing a workout thing with the Baltimore City Police Department. And my dad showed up, and my Ray was very impressed with my father's work ethic. And Ray and my dad formed a relationship over the years. And my dad was able to text Ray before every game. And there was one time where I just happened to have forgotten to text him. And he, next time that we encountered Ray, he said to me, Hey, Gene, where's those texts? He would print them out and put them in his helmet. Just to remind him to, you know, stay positive. He's like my family, yeah. That's the whole, uh, the reason. So too, I don't want the guy to win. The guy that shot me to win. If Gene is sort of like a living reminder of what can happen. Because he has determination like, uh, and no one else I know. He's an example of what you can do with what you have. There's always someone in a worse situation than you. And he would tell me that multiple times. And you don't have to crawl up in a corner. You don't have to give up. I mean, it's, it's, there's an inspiration there. My dad told me, no matter what, keep trying. Do not let anything get in the way of your goals. You know, on October 22nd of 1987, Clifton Frazier may have stolen my sight, yet not my vision. 